It's the penultimate weekend of the Rugby World Cup and you couldn't ask for two better semi-finals. Well, maybe not if you're Irish. Welcome to the Joe Pan Rugby Show, previewing every game of the knockout stages of the Rugby World Cup, brought to you by Sports Joe in association with Air Sport. I'm Rob O'Hanahan and joining me to look ahead to the second of those semi-finals is Joe's head of rugby, Jerry Flannery. Ireland's 46-14 hammering at the hands of the All Blacks last weekend saw them exit stage left with not so much as a whimper. We'll be looking at where Irish rugby is now and what hope there is in the 2026 Nations and beyond. Razi Erasmus has led his South Africa side into the last four, where they're set to take on the reigning Six Nations and Grand Slam champions Wales. The Springboks brought Japan's fairy tale to a shuddering halt last Sunday, while Wales came back from the dead against the France side who just couldn't hold it together at a major tournament again. Jerry, let's look ahead now with a lot of talk with the negativity around the Irish performance at the World Cup. Johnny Sexton said something at the pre-game press conference last week when he said at the end of the World Cup, you guys, the journalists, will probably turn on us and start calling for our heads, saying we're too old and that the next batch have to come through. I can see it already. Andy Farrell has a tough job going into the 2026 Nations, but it has to be a case of not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. This can't be a total shift from what we've known in Ireland in the last few years. Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> look, from Andy Farrell's point of view, he's going to probably want to impose his own his own ideas on the team. But I think that, I don't think there's going to be a, dr a, a drastic overhaul of, of, of the squad. Naturally, some players will start to filter out because of their age um, and Rory moving on, so they're going to have to find a new hooker. Um, but they have, they're, they're going to have a rough idea who, that, who that's going to be or who it's going to emerge from, what pool of players. But, but what Johnny is saying is, 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 is accurate. And um, it's so easy to almost, like if, if you're there and you're offering an opinion, to almost go, always go with the guy who hasn't had a shot yet because you yeah. can't be proven wrong because there's nothing to say, well, he had his go. So you're saying, like, oh, we need to get young players in there, young players in there. And there will need to be some changes in the Irish team. But, you know, it, it's the, the, I don't see the squad changing hugely for the Six Nations. You mentioned Andy Farrell implementing his own ideas. Do we know what they're going to be? There has to be some kind of concern, considering just how, let's be honest, dreadful 2019 was for Irish rugby. Andy Fowler was part of that setup. He's never been a head coach before. We've Mike Catt coming in and the attack side of things, who has been coaching Italy for the past few years, and again, not much to show there. Should we be a little bit concerned about this setup? <laughs> Jeez, you couldn't be more pessimistic, could you? <laughs> um, Look, I think that Andy Farrell is, is a phenomenal coach. He's got a massive work ethic. He's the players respect him hugely. Um, it is going to be it is going to be a transition for him going to be a head coach. But I, I've no doubt that you know he's been working under Joe for long enough. He'll have seen the stuff that Joe does. You know he can't do it all because he can't imitate Joe because no one can be Joe. Um, but there'll be things that he'll have he'll have taken on from him. There'll be good pretty much good continuity within the coaching setup going forward. And uh, look, I think. Look, I think that my cat thing coming in, you know, him him coaching Italy, he's probably going to be working with better players here now, and you know he's he, he seems to have a very good reputation as a coach. So I I, I think it's it's uh, a lot of it will come down to the form of the provinces as the as as we as we work into the Six Nations. Um, if we manage the the bringing the players back from the World Cup, getting them re-energised, making sure that they're healthy enough to get back on the field and perform, along with the good young talent that's there. I think if you watch any of the Pro 14 results so far, the Irish teams have have been pretty strong. Their second yeah. and third layers have been a lot stronger than teams they've been up against. So there is a good pool there. I think you take all of the good things that Joe did and then you add in, okay, well, how can we... How can we maximise? How can we take it on another step? And I think that that's probably where Andy Farrell's going to be. And people look at Andy Farrell because he's a defensive coach but yeah. if you're a defensive coach you're constantly looking at what what stresses your your area the most and then you go well the, when, when teams attack like this I find this very hard to defend so he'll probably be looking at bringing that in you know One of the bugbears of the Schmitz of Schmitz reign was the ban on foreign players it's not written anywhere as was said during the week by Sean O'Brien um, but it's pretty clear you play your rugby in Ireland or you do not play for Ireland. Would that be something that Farrell would look at, or do you think that they're just they're happy with the way they can manage players and how they can manage their welfare? I think it uh, from a lot of from a lot of areas, from a financial, um, in terms of you know, financially for the RFU, 
it works mm. having players wanting to play here because it just means that we're not having to directly compete with with, with France and with you know with England as well um, from a player welfare point of view it works as well because players realize that they'll get looked after better if they're playing in mm. Ireland and I think it's from a control point of view as well it just it, it, if you've got I think it will only at the moment there, there aren't enough top class players yeah. playing abroad that it's 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 an issue for the national coach. If, for instance, there was an exodus and we lost seven key players, then you might have to look at it. Much like Rassi Erasmus has had to do mm. with South Africa, but Ireland is 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 a much better place for players to play their rugby domestically than South Africa will be. So I think that I don't think it's going to be an issue. I think it works in in general. It has worked really well for us, and uh, I don't think it's something that the union will be will be keen on relinquishing control upon. And hence, Andy Farrell, I think, will 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 roll in with that. Speaking of minding players, there's a, I suppose, a fear that this would really affect this group of players. I think from going from the heights of 2018 and a genuine belief that we would be contenders at the World Cup to just exiting in the way that we did. How do the players manage that now over the next few months? There's going to be a lot of soul searching. They'll take their few weeks off before they return to the provinces. But a mental stain like this is going to stick around for a good while. Yeah, it, it's tough because the players are human and, and, and they would have, this would have been, you know, a long-term goal for a lot of them over the last four years and for them to, to get there and to fall short after doing so much good work in the build-up to it, it will be tough. That's why it's so important that the provinces, that the teams that they return to are successful. So those players need to take a mental break, they need to take a physical break, but when they come back in, you want them going into teams that are pushing and that are really competitive and they get that good, they, they, get, they feel good about themselves again, that they're winning and that, you know, if, if you're consistently beating players from France and from England, then when you go to national level, you're like, it's not that big a step up, I'm happy mm -hmm. to do it. But that's why they, where the, the form of the provinces is going to be important. You mentioned uh, Rory Best walking away, I think the only confirmed um, exeter from the, from the squad. He leaves two holes, and I'm going to focus on the first one, which is that of Hooker. Mm -hmm. And has Andy Farrell been left in a very difficult position where we actually don't have someone who's ready to step in because we have been so reliant on Rory Best over the last four years? Um, well, we, we, this was brought up as a point before the World Cup as well, that we were there wasn't someone there who was out and out as, as your second choice. I think... The guy, the heir apparent at the moment would probably be Niall Scannell, who's probably got the best fundamentals of all the other hookers. Uh, you could throw Sean Cronin in the mix there as well. Um, Rob Herring, obviously, they're the guys who are in the mix for the World Cup selection. And then you've got probably Rhys Marshall down in Munster. Um, Kevin O'Byrne is on good form there as well. So it's, it, that makes it difficult a little bit because, you know, if you want to get in the national setup, you've got to be first choice for, for your province. Um, after that, then you're looking down. You're looking down the line at younger players. Yeah. So it, you know, there's a transition. But that's going to be the same for almost almost every team. You know, around the world, there's going to be certain positions where someone's going to bow out after the World Cup, and they have to have people to step in. Mm. The second gap he leaves is the one of captain. Mm. Um, this is an interesting one because you're at the beginning of what we call this four-year cycle. So there's a decision to be made over whether you pick a young player who you know is going to be around for the World Cup. Or do you pick an experienced player who can kind of manage the transition period? Um, that's a difficult one for Andy Farrell. I saw Simon Zebo threw his name into the mix on Twitter for this uh, for the captaincy <laughs> role as well. But there's a decision to be made there. Or you could go the London Irish route and technically pick four captains this year. Mm. What do you think is the best way for Ireland to proceed? Um, well, when you're looking at who your captain is going to be, first of all, he has to be guaranteed on the team. Mm. And I think looking through it at the moment, I would say... Your guarantees at the moment are probably Tyg Furlong, they're probably James Ryan, um, Connor Murray, Johnny Sexton fits that role as well. Obviously, his, his age profile would be against him, but that mm. that the idea that we have to pick a captain now to be the captain at the next World Cup, I think, is is a is a big stretch, because if we have a we had a poor Six Nations last year and people started to lose their minds so the idea of discounting a Six Nations and just saying that we can just focus on the next World Cup it's 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 not it's it's false it's not reality so whoever whoever maybe Johnny Sexton is the easiest guy to step up mm -hmm. and get him as captain because you know he's he's going to be your first choice you know he's proven at that level you know he's the respect of everyone else within the squad James Ryan would be another option but possibly 
you know, he's, he's he's inexperienced. Like I don't think he's he's I don't think he's he's captain Leinster. So mm-hmm. it might be a little bit early for him, but he's definitely be over a four year cycle. He's definitely a guy that that could work into becoming a captain down the line. So maybe Johnny is probably the the, the standout guy at the moment. Peter Amani is there in the mix as well, who has captain Ireland, but. You know he's he's got a again like I said selection has got to be a non-negotiable. So yeah. you mentioned Irish fans and the media losing their heads around a bad Six Nations. What should Andy Farrell's aim be for this twenty twenty Six Nations? Is it to right the ship, build a winning culture again, get the confidence back up, or is it to start to blood those new players in? I think results. It's it's a results based industry, and um, uh, Andy Farrell will, will will be looking to to. To win the tournament, that's it's as simple as, and there's a natural cycle where players will 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 come in. They'll come into the mix, and that's how you start growing the the depth in your squad. I think um, at the last Six Nations, you know, we underperformed, and people said like, oh, we we should have experimented more. But I was like, well, everyone lost their minds when we lost England and lost to Wales. So um, it's difficult. And Andy Farrell, he'll, he'll be judged on his first head coaching job, so he he he'll, he'll want to get results. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't see it. There's, there's no other real way around it. Like you can't just say, Andy Farrell can't off the back of a Six Nations where he loses five games and says, "Well, look, I, I played all these players." I said, "Well, you played them. They clearly weren't great because we lost all our games." So, it, it's all based on results. Jerry, Wales take on South Africa this weekend in the second of the semi-finals. Before we even take a look at that game. We need to take a moment for the hosts. Japan were, unfortunately for a lot of people, beaten last weekend. They've been not only an incredible host in terms of the rugby that they've played, in terms of the fans, in terms of the stadiums and the noise and the colour and everything else, but they've proven that they need to be in Tier 1 rugby. And to be perfectly honest, that Tier 1 rugby probably needs a team like Japan. Yeah, I agree with you. They they were a great advert. Um, They played fantastic rugby. It was like watching the Japan and South Africa game was like, were the good guys versus the bad guys. You had the <laughs> Japanese who were trying to be so positive and move the ball, and and South Africa were just like smashing them down, maul, 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 yeah. kick, kick, kick. But that's unfortunately that's the way the laws are are probably rewarding teams sometimes when they don't have the ball. Um, but Japan were were they were they were a great advert. They were brilliant for the game. Um, they had the benefit of being able to have or. 216 or 200 or over 200 days in yeah. camp leading to the World Cup they won't get that now going forward so it's it's important that it's not that there's that there's layers below that that current squad mm-hmm. so that they can be competitive uh, but yeah a hundred percent get them in playing tier one rugby whether it's in the championship whether it's even to play Six Nations, they, they they should be playing Tier 1 rugby. Yeah, and I think as well, like the, their style of rugby has been phenomenal. Something else that's caught the eye this week, particularly the coaches, the four coaches in the semi-finals, who I think are more than happy to talk about is this spying issue. Eddie Jones has raised it. The South African backs coach came out and said that he uh, just, it ruins the game, he's no time for it. Mm. Um, I was wondering if you ever had any experience of that. Like you obviously worked with Razzie, worked with Felix. We know Felix was deep undercover in the Irish camp for a couple of years before mm. he went over to the mm. box. Um, but did Razzie ever send you... Felix was an undercover spy who'd been working for yeah. years in Irish rugby. He was placed in St Andrew's school. <laughs> he assimilated into Irish culture and then eventually he went and, and screwed us exactly. over. Exactly. Like this is, this is real deep level stuff. But I'm wondering, did Razzie ever send you uh, up a tree with a, with a telephoto lens or anything no, like that? No, no, no. It's... Um, I saw what Eddie Jones was saying is that like you can generally see everything at the moment. There's mm. so much analysis. You know the game like you can you can you can go on Opta, you can access games, you can see anything from any player. Um, there's definitely still an advantage if you knew the lineout formations a certain team were repping that week. You could prepare for that better. Yeah. Um, and if you can see certain things that they're doing, if they're posting videos of, uh, on their club on their website. Uh, on the club website or the, the national team website of, of images and training, you can see certain drills they're trying to replicate. Mm-hmm. Say, look, this is something they're working on, but but the actual going out and the, the covert climbing up trees and like that's it's it's not good for the game. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, you have to be aware of it. Like when when I played with Munster, our, one of our forwards coaches, Brian Hickey, was super paranoid about it, and we'd be doing lineouts the day of a game and. Uh, at, a, at a hotel and if he saw someone looking out the window at a hotel he'd be sending 
somebody up to go and check to make sure that they weren't a, an opposition spy. And it does happen, so you have to be you have to be aware of it. Even when we'd be training with Munster, if we saw people come down and record, like people, some supporters would come down, they might just be recording yeah. training on their phone. But if we saw them recording our lineups, we'd have to say, "Listen, can you stop recording, please, or delete that, or um, because you just don't want that getting out there." You know, wow. margins really are razor thin at that level. Yeah, well. It could come down to one one set piece turnover, and you just want to try and, you know, reduce the risk of your team being being on the on the wrong side of that, and you have to be mindful of it. Okay, looking ahead then to the game itself, uh, once the spying and everything else is done mm. with, um, you mentioned last week when Wales were going in to face France that your concern for them, for them might have been up front where they lacked a bit of ballast and a bit of grunt. Mm. There's no other team in world rugby who are going to expose that like South Africa. Are Wales going to struggle this weekend? I think it's going to be a big, big challenge for them. I think um, Navidi out now, Moriarty in. Moriarty is probably a, their most physical forward. Um, the the Welsh the Welsh pack have, have generally they've all got a really good skill set, really skillful players. If you look at their back line, you look at Hadley Parks, looking at George North. You know these are guys who can massively. Uh, John Davies when he plays. Yeah. They're guys who can who can win momentum for you. So they're they've got some backs who are actually probably better momentum winners than their forwards, which I think they they utilise to get them a little bit of front forward front uh, front football. Um, but yeah, the South Africa. If you look at what South Africa have picked again, they've gone with a six two split. They've started with their biggest heaviest players, Malherbe, Mbangi at, at, at hooker again, mm. starting with Lou Dieger again with Mostert on the bench. I think that they're going to go and. The philosophy is slow poison. That's the South African, where they just they're just grinding you down with mauls and it's building the lactate in your in 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 your legs and eventually it starts to. You may not see it pay pay dividends in the first fifty minutes, but from you know fifty five minutes on, then you start to see teams start you know guys' legs get heavy. That's probably why rassi has gone with a six two split in his bench. He's probably started with his biggest heaviest pack. He's going to bring on the like a Mal Malcolm Marks. Kitchoff, Mostert, bring them on. Francois Lowe to look at pick off some um, some some poaches on the ground, and and just grind them down. So Wales are going to have uh, they're going to have a, it's that's going to be a big challenge for them because it's 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 hard to get away from that when it comes down to set piece like South Africa. If they get a line out, they are going to maul you. So if South Africa want to take the or if, if Wales want to try and take them on there in just a battle of the mauls, it's going to be really really hard. Mauls Wales maul D has been pretty good. But you either stop, you don't give them line outs, which can be difficult. You, you compete to try and steal the ball so you don't have to defend them all, or you get them all on the ground, which is what New Zealand did. Um, a lot of focus on the South African forwards, but one of the players of the tournament has been Cheslin Colby. He's ruled out. Mm. Um, now, on the other wing, we do have Makazola Mampimpi, who scored 13 tries in his last 12 games, and no one else has scored more tries in that time than him. But he's more of a finisher. Are, are South Africa actually creating anything in the kind of from 10 to 12 to 15? Um, I think they've been, that's probably the area you're going to be critical of them. I don't think Andre Pollard or Willie Leroux have had their best World Cup. Um, they're their two most creative players. And that's like, as you're 10 and you're 15, guys who step up as first receiver and create and, and manage the game for you. Um, I don't think they've fired well. Delende and Lucan Yoam are, are both very very physical players but again probably not 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 f out and out footballers like you would say Willie Leroux would be so it's it's a shame that when they have someone like Mapimpi out there who's such a good finisher that they're not creating the opportunities like some of the stuff against Japan in the second half was just basic catch pass which they didn't execute well the strength of that South African team has always been their kicking game and their set piece and that's what won them the game you just want to make sure that you don't go away from what your strengths are but they need to be I think Pollard and if Pollard and Larue start to fire for them, that will take a lot of the the onus off having to have the best mall in, mm. in in world rugby because it is a fantastic mall and it's really really effective. But you just want to get a balance between the two. While South Africa kind of ground the life out of Japan, Wales and France couldn't have been a more different game. Wales mm. again came back from the dead against the French side that looked to have finally caught fire at the right time. Dan Bigger's comments afterwards were quite interesting. He said that we have to count ourselves a bit lucky, but if I'm being honest, I don't care. Um, they must take something from winning and really grinding out a game like they did. 
Yeah, I, they've, they've, they've got a great mentality within the squad. Whatever way Gatlin has put it together, and that's probably why he's had such longevity as a head coach, is that there's a really good culture within the group. It's, it's just about, like, he, they don't seem to care that people say, look, only oh, just scraped through there, you know, or, you know, they won a Grand Slam without playing a huge amount of rugby. Yeah. Uh, they lost three out of four games in the warm-ups, but they went into the World Cup saying, we, we can win this World Cup. And, and you know, by all rights, France were the better side and France should have gone through, but they don't care. Like, Wales are literally saying, yeah, whatever it is, you know, you don't want to be having your best performance in a quarter final. You want to be having your best performance to, to win you the toughest games you're going to play. Um, they made hard work of it against France, but... I, I can understand where bigger is coming from, you know. Yeah, they got a lot of help as well from Vahamina's red card, which is possibly the most senseless thing I've ever seen on a rugby pitch. Yeah, uh, I think I've seen a few as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's just sometimes that French team just like they defy logic and everything else in between. But what actually really catapulted into it was Jacko Piper's picture with the Welsh fans on mm. Sunday. I was wondering what you made of that. For anyone who missed it, Piper decided to not only pose with Welsh fans who were imitating the elbow itself, but actually did it himself as well. And as a result, wasn't considered for the semi-finals. Was that fair? Or do you want your referees to show a bit of character? Uh, I think I think it's good to have referees with character. Um, I think Jacko Piper could possibly have, you know, he could definitely have, have been smarter there around it because... You have like, you have a French nation. The thing is, no one disputes the decision. It was a yeah. clear red card. So, but there's just a, like boxing a little bit clever. It's almost like rubbing salt in the wound. The guy who actually had to deliver the red card, doing that with the with the with the Welsh fans, it's probably just more time a timing. Uh, that I would say an error of timing. Mm. Like I wouldn't see any issue with it. Like a you know a couple of weeks later, him taking that picture with them. But uh, you want referees are human, and people want to. You know, supporters enjoy the affinity that's there between the officials and between players and them being normal and being relatable. It's just timing. Yeah. It's not great. Do you think that there's an issue of a culture of celebrity around referees in, in rugby? When I think when you look at other sports, you don't see as much folks in the referee, maybe because they don't have as much of an impact. But I'm thinking of the personalities of certain referees um, and how there's such a small pool that we know them so well. Is that a difficulty where sometimes referees seek out that light or seek out that little bit of fame? Uh, I don't. I don't think so. I don't think there's a. I don't think you're gonna have any like celebrity reality series with referees or anything like that. I don't think. I don't think they're pitching for that. It's just a little bit of their personality comes across, which okay. is generally good for the game as long as they're just consistent in how they officiate the laws. Um, Nigel Owens is probably the biggest, the biggest exponent of that, and and he does it well. Um, again, the most important thing is that there's just there's just consistency across all referees in in how they officiate the laws. Um, but I don't I don't see an issue with um, if a if if a referee puts his own flavour on 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 how he how he refs the game, but he does it consistently with the ref from the previous game or the next guy who's going to come up. Uh, I've no issue with that. I quite like the idea of kind of a big brother style program with all the, the world rugby referees in there. I think that could really work. Um, looking ahead finally to the result of this, Wales don't have a great recent record against South Africa. Uh, they've South Africa have won 16 games in a row uh, between 2014, but Wales have won the last four meetings. The last time they were beaten by South Africa was at a World Cup. Mm. Does that kind of form come into it, or do you think it'll play any kind of? A no, role? I don't. I don't think so. I think like. Um, I think some some of Rassi's earliest games when he took over, where they played they played the played the Welsh in a, in a, in some friendlies and they lost the game, but it was very much experimental. I don't think any of those things really really come into like players are so short term focused. The players are thinking about how did I play last week. They're like, mm, I played pretty well. I feel confident, or else. You get players saying, oh, I didn't play great last week, but we still won, so right, I'm going to box that off and I'm just going to deliver here. Mm. I don't think there's going to be any huge hang-up between the, between the Welsh feeling, oh, you know, we don't have a historically a great record against, against the South Africans, and I don't think the, the Welsh are going to be coming in, or the South Africans are going to say, well, this should be a walk in the park because yeah. historically, we've statistically, we've, we've won more games than they have. Um, it's just literally the team's pitching on the day and whoever executes their game plan the best. And who do you see doing that on Sunday? Um, I I thought the I what's impressed me with the Welsh so far was 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 seeing how Gareth Davies how effective he's been. Mm. 
I think when the when the French they targeted the line out delivery and the set piece delivery to Davies, and once once the, his threat was negated, their attack didn't really fire. Also, their kicking game, the 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 way that the the Welsh, their kicking game against the French, just kept kicking the ball and leaving yeah. it in field all the time, allowing the French to keep coming back at them, whereas you would have thought it would have been a, a better idea to force structure on the game. I think that I think that I think South Africa will do this. Uh, South Africa have been playing ugly so far, so they're they're due a big a big performance. Mm -hmm. The reality is that with, with losing Cheslin Colby, you're trying to see what, where's the creativity going to come. So Pollard and Willie Leroux have to step up, and if they do, I think they'll have more than enough. Perfect, thanks, Jerry. And that is all we have time for on today's episode of the Joe Pan Rugby Show, brought to you by Sports Joe in association with Air Sport. A reminder that Wales v South Africa is available on the Air Sport package this Sunday. Kickoff in that one is at 9 a.m. Irish time, with coverage starting at 8 o'clock. For a look ahead to the other semi final this weekend, follow the link in the comments below as myself and Jerry preview the clash between England and New Zealand. We'll be back next week as we look ahead to the final of the Rugby World Cup, as well as the third and fourth place playoff. We'll see you then. Thank <laughs> you.